Okay guys, in this video segment we're going to talk about uh, solutions and how we can take a concentrated solution and then dilute that down into a less concentrated solution and then the math behind that. So um, be ready for that um, coming up here in a day or so. Now if we move on from Beer's Law, talking more about dilution. When you dilute something, what you're doing is you're taking your concentrated solution and you're adding only solvent to it. Okay, So you're not adding any solute and you're not changing your amount of solute. So whatever solute you had before will be the same as you had after. Um, if you take a look at this picture, we have concentrated solution over here, and each glass moving down is more and more diluted. So you see how the different amount of light passed through here, going back to Beer's Law, where this one, very concentrated, isn't going to let much light through. Here, very dilute, is going to let a lot of that um, solution through. Okay. So imagine like if you had a cup of coffee and it was too strong. Well, what would you do to make it less strong? Well, you just add some water to that. Um, or if someone made up some Kool-Aid too strong, or if you put too much meal into um, your, your water bottle, you might just add some more water to that to dilute it down a little bit. Now, that works fine if you don't really care about concentrations, but if you have to actually calculate the differences or you're trying to make a very specific concentration solution, um, you need to go through the equation. Okay? So here's our dilution formula. M1V1 equals M2V2. M1 is the molarity of your concentrated. Sometimes we call this the stock solution. Um, V1 is a concentration of that solution. And then M2 is molarity of your dilute. And <clears throat> V2 is a volume of that dilute. Basically what we're saying is that if you take the concentration times how much is there, that doesn't change with the dilution. So take your new concentration, multiply how much you have, that amount, that ratio would still be the same there Okay, in terms of what these two equal. So what we can do is we can start with a concentrated solution and we can solve for what we're going to make for a dilute solution or if we have a dilute solution we can figure out what we started with as a concentrated solution. So let's go through some practice problems. So problem number one, concentrated HCl is 12 molar. You want to make 250 milliliters of 3.0 molar HCl. That of word between there reminds you that you're multiplying these two things together because you have your concentration of a certain amount. So you have 250 milliliters of 3 molar. So what volume of 12 molar do you need? Okay. So you have enough of this, we just need to know how much we want. So we're looking for the V1 here. Okay. Um, we know what our concentration is to start. We know our ending volume and our ending concentration. So now solve for um, how much HCl you need. Once you have that done, the last step is how much water do you need to add to make it to that. Because you can't just use the concentrate, you actually have to have a volume or amount of water to add to it also. Okay? So go ahead and do the practice calculation, give it a shot, pause the video, and then I'll give you the key here in a second. Okay, so let's take a look at the answer key now. If you take a look, we rearrange our equation. We have our volume solving for our V1. We have our concentration times the volume of V of the second of the dilute divided by the concentration of your stock solution and we get 62.5 milliliters of your stock solution. Now that's only half the story. The other half is, well if you have 62.5 milliliters of the concentrated, how do we get to 250? Well the total between this plus the water has to equal 250. So for the second part, how do we solve for how much water we use? It's just a, it's just a subtraction. So take the total you want minus how much stock solution you're going to put in and that will tell you how much water to add to it. So if you're going to make this up, you would measure out 62.5 milliliters, pour it into a beaker, measure out 187.5 milliliters of water, pour that into the same beaker, stir them up, and you now have made a 3 molar solution from a 12 molar solution. Okay. Um, notice how as we look at significant figures, these don't necessarily match what you're making. It always it comes back to what you have or what you've already measured. In there because these numbers here really are not measured in this process. Dilution 2 practice, um, a little bit different difference with this one. First we're going to dissolve a certain mass in grams of our copper chloride to make 5 liters. So step 1 isn't diluting. Step 1 is going actually back to last week where we actually made a solution. So step 1 is make a solution called a stock solution. Step 2 is then do the dilution. Okay, so two parts to this problem. Go ahead and do those two parts, pause the video, and we'll come back in a second. Okay, here we go. So the first part, we need to figure out how many 
how much the concentration is going to be of the solution. So if you take your grams, convert to moles. Um, we have a half a liter, so take your moles, divide it by that half a liter, and then the concentration of the solution that we made was four molar. Okay. Now that's your stock solution, or that's your concentrated. Um, we have a half a liter of it, so if we take that four molar, take it times the half liter, divide it by the 0.25 molar, or how much we want to dilute it to, that tells us that we can make eight liters of this diluted solution. Okay. So if you wanted to make 10 liters, you wouldn't have made enough to start. Uh, you'd have to either put more mass in, so you have a, a stronger or more concentrated stock solution, or you'd have had to use more of your volume with the mass together. Okay, So that is um, dilution practice number two. Other ways that we are able to calculate concentrations are by percentages. Okay, This process is not real challenging, but we do want to mention it and make sure we have it into our notes. So there's two ways of doing it by percent. Percent by volume and percent by mass. When you do percent by volume, it's just your volume of your solute over the volume of your solution. By mass, same idea. Instead, we change it to mass of solute. We still use the volume of a solution, and we tend to work with grams and milliliters here to keep that ratio correct. Now, you'll notice that people, when they do percents, they might label them V over V or M over V to tell you if it's been done by volume or done by mass, because that would be a different number if you, um, according to the different densities that different substances have. Okay? So two practice problems to do for percentages. We dissolve 25 grams of sodium chloride into 125 milliliters of water. What's the percent composition by mass? And we have hydrogen peroxide that's sold as 3% by volume. How many milliliters of H2O2 are in a 400 milliliter bottle? Okay, so when you actually buy hydrogen peroxide from the store, those brown bottles, um, they're about 400 milliliters full. And because it's 3%, so how many milliliters are you paying for there? Because the rest of it's actually water. Go ahead and try these two, pause the video, and I'll come back with the answers. Okay, so here's your two answers. Um, I don't have the work shown with these because the math is actually pretty straightforward. Here you're just taking 25 divided by 125 to get 20%. Down here, you're just taking your 400 times the 3% to get the 12 milliliters between those two numbers. Okay? Now, there's another type of concentration that we see, especially in the world of like environmental stuff, medical world, safety industry, those kind of things. That's PPM and PPB. Now, PPM and PPB stand for the same thing, essentially. It's parts per million or parts per billion. Okay, and It really isn't much different than a percentage. It's just how many pieces do you have per million pieces or how many pieces do you have per billion pieces. Now, we use this measurement usually when we're dealing with very, 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 very small concentrations. Um, it's more useful that way when you're dealing with really small amounts because you don't have to have scientific notation and using very, very small numbers. So you can say things like two parts per million or ten parts per billion, and it still represents a really small amount, but then you're using whole numbers to represent that. Okay. Now, if you take a want, if you want, take a minute and look up the PPM um, for carbon monoxide. That's one of the really common things that we we use is for gases in our environment. So carbon monoxide in our house, okay, we have some. Carbon monoxide is not real safe for us to be in there. That's why we have carbon monoxide detectors. Um, if you want to, take a minute and look up what is the safe level for carbon monoxide in your home. Okay, If you just do a Google search on that, it'll come up with a number pretty easily for you there. Okay, But it's just one way that we measure concentration is through how many pieces per million, how many pieces per billion there. Okay, so if we get some numbers to this now, your number of ppm is equal to the number of atoms of a substance out of every million atoms. So for example, if you had 20, 20 parts per million of carbon monoxide, you'd end up with 20 molecules of carbon monoxide and 1 million molecules of air. Okay? Now, 20 is not the answer to this question down here. It's just an example I use there. So if you're interested, take a minute and look that up and see what you get from there. Okay? All right, guys, that ends our video today. Our next segment goes into molality and colligative properties. Thank you.